speaker today, which is really why you all came here. And so on behalf of Carol and your organization, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Valerie Mendoza for her presentation of Beyond Brown, Mexican Struggles for Equality Before and After Brown v. Board. So if I can just ask you to take a moment to turn off your cell phone so that we can all enjoy the program. And remember that the information presented as well as what we share and discuss is of value and of interest. And so we just agree that we will respect one another's opinions. Now that we're in agreement, we're gonna get started. Dr. Mendoza is the director of the Strengthening Institutions Grant at Washburn University. She received her PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley, and is originally from Topeka. Her interests include the history of Mexicans in the United States, gender studies, and ethnic studies. Welcome, Valerie. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation to, to speak to you all. I'm, I'm really excited to be here um, in front of this group that I admire so much. So to get us started, what do you think of when you think of segregation? What does that word bring to mind for you all? Schools? Housing, neighborhood, transportation, separation. Yeah, absolutely, all of that. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, you got it right, <laughs> right? Lots of people think about things like this image. Right, separate water fountains with signs. You know, um, it's a little hard to see with the the zoom thing up at top, but um, we know this image, right? The color drinking fountain is on one side, and the larger uh, drinking fountain is um, is for whites. But segregation um, affects those of us who are brown as well. <laughs> my grandparents would tell me stories about having to take carry out from the back door of restaurants because they weren't allowed in and um, things like they could only swim in um, the city pool here in Topeka on the day before um, they were going to uh, drain it, right? <gasps> Um, and the water was going to be changed or, you know, they had to uh, sit in the balcony of the theaters. This is um, the Nomar Theater in Wichita and you can see the balcony back there, but there were also theaters in Topeka that um, did the, the same thing. And we even had uh, separate schools for Mexican children here in Topeka as well. This is, this is a picture of the Branner School, but next to it or behind it, I, I'm, I'm not sure which, there was a, a, a much smaller school called the Branner Annex. And the Annex was for the Mexican children in the neighborhood. And this, this Branner School was um, for the white children in, uh, in the neighborhood. Um, so we know being Kansans and Topekans that the most famous case uh, to end segregation in schools and eventually in all public places in throughout the nation was the lawsuit um, in which several families in Topeka um, in initiated called Brown v. Board of Education. That now famous ruling that separate schools were inherently unequal took place in 1954 and schools across the country were told to desegregate with all deliberate speed, right? But the Brown case wasn't the beginning or the end of segregation, especially for those of Mexican descent who lived in Kansas and the U.S. Has anybody heard of Mendez v. Westminster? A few of you. So this was a case that took place in 1947, seven years before Brown. 
And it was a case that helped uh, desegregate schools in California. The Lemon Grove incident, which took place in 1931, was also another case that um, helped the cause of school desegregation against uh, Mexican uh, American students. In 1929, the League of United Latin American Citizens was formed in Corpus Christi, Texas, and soon had chapters all over the country, including a chapter in um, Topeka that was uh, developed in the early 1970s and is still in existence to um, today. And they fought for one of its core missions was to, to fight discrimination. So what I'd like to do today is talk about school segregation throughout Kansas, then talk about resistance to the segregation and cultural thriving. And then um, I'd like to end the presentation with learning from you all and your experiences um, with segregation here in Topeka or wherever, um, wherever you grew up or, or um, were from. So first, we're going to talk about Kansas City. And um, just so we're all on the same page, Kansas, um, Mexicans came to Kansas in their early 1900s, mostly to work um, on the railroad, sometimes to um, work um, in uh, the beet fields out in Western Kansas, also doing some work in uh, packing plants in the Kansas City area. And that's where um, we're going to start. We're going to start in uh, Kansas City. So it might surprise you to know that in the um, early 1900s, Kansas City actually had a tri-racial school system. There were separate schools for Anglos, separate schools for Blacks, and separate schools for Mexican children at the elementary level. Um, so sometimes Mexican children were taught in um, basements of um, elementary schools before uh, outright segregation actually occurred. And here's a, a picture of one of the um, of the Claire Barton School um, in Kansas City, um, Kansas. So Anglo parents objected to their children, quote unquote, mixing with Mexican children um, for for a lot of reasons. And in 1922, they um, in Kansas City, they took up a petition to uh, for a separate Mexican elementary school, and that's when this Claire Barton School um, came to be. It opened in 1923, and the district um, it was a three-room annex on the grounds of another school. In 1924, there was yet another segregated school that was built for Mexican um, American children, and then eventually a third in another Kansas City, Kansas neighborhood. And you can kind of get a, a, an idea from this photo. There was no playground equipment. Um, there was also no kindergarten or summer school for these children, um, as in as there would be for, at um, schools for white children. Those the kindergarten and the the summer school were provided by a Methodist mission. Um, in Kansas City and elsewhere in Kansas, Mexicans were treated much the same as African Americans in terms of these separate facilities, discriminatory treatment, social in um, social inequalities. Um, and so the reason that uh, this tripartite system was advanced was the argument went, well, Mexican students lack English skills and we really want to Americanize them. So we need them in a separate school so they don't hold our children, um, our children back, right? Um, and as you can imagine, you can kind of, Again, see in this photo, oftentimes separate Mexican schools, um, such as this one, um, did not meet health department um, standards. Um, one school in Kansas City, the Major Hudson Annex, was examined in 1939, and it still had outdoor toilets. There were eight grades with only five teachers, and that included the principal. Um, in 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 this case, um, in this school, there were literal lines drawn in the playground to keep Mexican children on one side and white children um, on, on the other side. 
students were, um, you know, often spanked uh, for, for um, or their hands were hit with a ruler for speaking Spanish. Names were changed so it's from Maria to Mary or Jesusa to Hazel in the case of my grandmother. Um, and it was not unusual to be singled out for um, harassments by um, teachers, especially as students got um, older. So um, elsewhere in Kansas, in Emporia, um, for example, Mexican students attended Catholic schools. And it, that was kind of a way that they um, were, um, were segregated. They were also, um, this also occurred in, in schools in the elementary age in um, Wichita, Chanute, and Ottawa. In Newton, in the 1920s, Mexican children were not encouraged to attend public schools at all. Um, I think they were trying to save money on that separate, separate school. And um, they largely stayed away until there was a Spanish-speaking nurse who persuaded the parents of 45 students to enroll in school. This swelled the number of Mexican students so much that the Anglo teachers threatened to quit. <laughs> Um, and the nurse ended up teaching the students on her own in a separate facility for three years until that practice um, was abolished. And eventually, Mexican students um, did attend integrated um, schools. However, they were not allowed to play on sports teams for many years until, you know, it took that one student to um, resist and change um, that policy. In Hutchison, Mexican children attended um, public schools with Anglo ones throughout the 1920s, but in the 1930s, those Anglo parents, again, used that um, uh, process of the petition, and they gathered 655 signatures and requested that the school board build separate schools for Mexican children. And again, using that argument of, oh, they have linguistic deficiencies, um, but also this dislike of that foreign element um, in school. And um, the other argument they used was some of the children were at such an advanced age for the grade level that um, they, didn't, they didn't want those older children in the same classroom as their, um, their younger children. Um, the school board um, consulted um, you know, up at the state level and they said, no, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't allow that. But what they did was they remodeled the existing school to educate Mexican students in two separate rooms, and they segregated them that way. So technically, they're in the same school and integrated, but they're off to the side in, um, in separate, sorry, separate rooms. Now, in Dodge City, um, in the 19... Um, in the early years, 1920s, 1930s, barbers, barbers would not cut the hair of Mexican children. Even the, and it was a requirement that children had their hair a certain, um, a certain length, especially um, the boys. So what happened was a Mexican man decided, oh, well, you know, we want our children to go to school, so I'm gonna cut their hair. Well, he did not have a license to do that. And so he was arrested, but luckily, he came before a, a judge, and the judge um, ruled that barbers in the city had to cut the hair of those um, Mexican um, students. Now, in Dodge City, um, the students there attended an all-Mexican um, school called the Coronado School, beginning in 1915, and they, um, that school existed through 1947. Um, this school in particular, the Coronado School, was funded and built by a private citizen. It had two rooms and one teacher for grades one through three. I want to tell you a little bit about this school. The Coronado School was visited in 1923 by um, a bunch of educators from KU who were touring the state and looking at um, the schools throughout the state. At the time um, the teachers came to look at the school in Dodge City, 
they assumed that it was a temporary school because it was in such a dilapidated shape. And remember, this is just like what, eight years after it first opened and it would go on to be used for another 20. <laughs> okay. um, the report that the educators from KU um, made marked that the school was so inadequate. Um, they noted, quote, it is wholly impossible with such facilities to provide satisfactory elementary instruction, end quote. Um, when Mexican students were finally allowed to attend the public schools with white children, oftentimes they were um, in Dodge City, at least, oftentimes they were put in the special, special education classroom on the assumption that they couldn't speak English and so wouldn't thrive in a normal classroom. The caveat here is they were never actually tested. <laughs> One student who, who was sharing these stories in oral history later as an adult said, I got out of that special ed classroom, but the only reason that happened was because I had a job in um, the main office of the school and the principal heard me speaking English and put me into the normal classroom. And then I moved up and the student um, went on to um, attend and graduate from um, high school. Otherwise he would have been stuck in this classroom where he said his curriculum consisted of crayons, scissors, and a, and a pad of paper. So there really wasn't any actual instruction um, um, happening. Um, in Topeka, I already mentioned the Branner Annex. Um, which was described in 1932 by Principal Alan E. Cord, who said um, that the Branner Annex consisted of four portable rooms, two old brick toilet buildings, um, and this uh, school children attended through third grade, by which time it hoped that they, could, the hope was that they could speak English and be put into um, a regular um, classroom at another school. Now, there wasn't any teacher training <laughs> in Spanish to help these students learn and you know give them instructions on um, what to do. So as you can imagine, this prolonged the adjustment period of um, linguistic and educational um, transition. Now here you see a picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe School. This is the original building. Um, from the 1920s, the um, school was, I believe, downstairs in the church, was upstairs, if um, I'm remembering um, correctly. This school began in the 1920s, and students here were taught by the Sisters of Charity of Leavenworth. And I want to share with you what one sister remembered um, years later. She said, quote, there were about 40 beginners. I don't know how I managed to teach them, because only 12 of the number understood a word of English, right? By the next year, the number of children attending that school doubled and children were crowded to um, two children per seat um, in, into, um, into the school. And they were taught in one large room that was petitioned by a curtain to separate first through third grades from fourth through sixth grades. Um, Five years after its opening, so 1925, the number of students had ballooned to 265 in the school with just four teachers. So um, I can't do my math fast enough, but that's a pretty big size <laughs> of class, right? So one nun recalled, quote, each year the sisters um, have help from their friends in order to supply one book for every two children. They are grateful to even get secondhand books. And eventually the school was condemned in 1952 after um, the flood and the parish priest um, convinced actually local businessmen to um, raise money to build a new school for, um, for the children, the Mexican children, in, in mostly in Oakland, Bottoms, the area called um, Neutral. And his argument, the argument of this priest to these Topeka area businessmen was that um, if you build the school for us, this is gonna save taxpayers money because these kids aren't gonna go to the, um, the public school. So, you know, we're saving you money. Um, and so this new school was built and opened in um, November of 
1953. So despite these um, kind of this beginning of, you know, ideas of segregation in the school, Our Lady of Guadalupe did go on to provide, and it did even in its early days, provide a supportive atmosphere um, and eventually activities and support of cultural maintenance took place, such as the learning of um, the history of Mexican Independence Day, Cinco de Mayo, traditional dances, that, that sort of thing. And students in the 1980s even took second place in the State History Day competition um, with their original play titled The Bells of 1933, which was based on the history of Topeka's um, fiesta. So that segues and transitions me a little bit into um, notions of resistance. But before I, I talk a little bit about that, comments or questions on anything that I've mentioned so far? Yeah. This information is coming mostly from the Kansas State Historical Society. Yeah, so as far as I know, all of these records are housed in the Historical Society, which is out um, west in the western part of town off of Wanamaker. <laughs> no, no, because when I, when I used them and I um, pulled them, they were in the storage at that um, Historical Society building out there. So, yeah. Other? Some of it is, yes, absolutely. Some of these photos are, um, actually most of these photos are on the internet, for sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, okay. <laughs> I bet your mom loved that. <laughs> Okay, so outdoor toilets. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so this building is on the same block though where the the school and church are right there mm -hmm. okay yeah right Um, well, here in Topeka, the Topeka Public Schools, at least, were already prior to that um, decision starting to integrate. Um, so, and like I mentioned, you know, Branner Annex School was um, demolished, you know, I think it was in the late, late 40s. So, um, yeah, but there was, you know, I mean, you could argue that, you know, this Catholic school was a form of segregation. I mean, that can be one way of looking at it for sure, right? Um, or you can see, as I was kind of alluding to um, at the end of my remarks just now, that it, it could have also been seen as a, a form of cultural resilience and a safe space for um, Mexican children. Yeah, it's kind of... No.
No, they, um, well, that's a good question. It's nuanced. <laughs> um, so there was the Burner Annex, which was a public school for them. But eventually, like my mom attended Lincoln School, which was in the bottoms. And so that was like, what, mid 50s. Um, the, the... Yeah, and we'll, yeah, and we'll, we'll uh, my remarks will talk about that a little bit because um, in the eyes of the, at least the federal government, dating all the way back to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican-American War in 1848, Mexicans are considered white. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, question over here and then, Lisa. Did you, somebody over here still have, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question in, in terms of, I think, in, in at some points, yes, there were laws that didn't allow them to attend white, the white, you know, schools with public schools with white children. But I think also there was that familiarity with Catholic and more of a trust with the Catholic schools, since that was the religion of the families, right? And it, it is the case with our um, Lady of Guadalupe school. It, you know, it was again that safe space where other Mexican children were going. So it became a question of do I send my child to the public school with mostly white children or do I send my child to the Catholic school with mostly Mexican children where they'll know people and be around people who are familiar so you know again like my that's my dad by the way <laughs> and so his family sent him to Guadalupe right but my mom sitting in the back there um her family sent her to the public school in Lincoln so it, it, it was really just a family decision I think yeah, it was a no nobody's ever asked me that <laughs> um Yes and no. You know, one of the things I like that I love about doing this and about being able to present this talk through Humanities Kansas is that, you know, I get to share stories that aren't known. I get to uncover, you know, and share with you all um, these more nuanced, um, you know, segregation wasn't just black and white, right? So I enjoy that that part of it quite a bit um and learning some of this stuff sometimes it shocks me but um sometimes it's just like so um uh, it fills me with pride as well and so that's that's kind of my next my next story i want to talk to you all um about and then we can get back to some more questions um so i want to go back to um kansas city because there are a couple of very little known stories um, of resistance of Mexican families to this segregation. So the first one starts in um, the early 1920s, 1923 or 1924, I can't remember at the moment. Um, but um, there was a new uh, junior high that was opened in Kansas City and it was called the Major Hudson School. And it was meant for whites only. And four Mexican boys in, enrolled in that, that school because it was near their house and that's where their families wanted them to go. By that afternoon, 200 angry Anglo parents surrounded the building threatening, quote, bodily injury to the Mexican children. The school had to call the police to escort the Mexican children home out of the school for their own safety, not to arrest 
the protesting people who, who were threatening them. Um, so the, what happened was that the Mexican parents removed their children from school entirely rather than having them attend the segregated school, right? Because the, the school officials were like, no, you know what, you're, this is the school for white children. Your, your children weren't supposed to be here in the first place. They need to attend this other school. And the parents were like, no, I want my children to, um, to attend this school. So what the parents did was they lobbied the um, a Mexican consul in who had an office in uh, in Kansas City, and they said, "Hey, this is happening. Our children are Mexican citizens, and they're not being allowed to attend a public um, a public school." And I just found this. This is one of those ah, I can't believe as a historian, I found this. So this is a telegram from the um, Mexican consul to um, the governor talking about this inst incident and protesting the treatment of um, the boys um, who were threatened by the parents. And the consul, this is just the first page, it's like a four page telegram. I can't imagine how expensive that was back in the day. <laughs> but um, he's saying, you know what, the, these boys were being threatened, their parents weren't even there to protect them. Um, you know, this is wrong. We expect more from, you know, your illustrious city and state. Um, and so there was this back and forth, you know, the Mexican consul eventually when he didn't get a satisfactory answer from the government went to the state department. He was like, Hey, this is happening in Kansas. Um, can you, can you help? Um, so it was this back and forth and the state department was like, no, sorry, that's a state issue. So it goes back to the governor. The governor says, no, that's a city issue. So he says, no, that's really um, an issue for the school district. We didn't, we're not, so, you know, it's all this. Um, so what happened was the children were keeping their parents, I mean, the parents were keeping their children out of school. Wow the parents were brought to court under, under the compulsory education law that said, hey, your kids are truant and you are going to be fined if you do not send them um, back to um, school. Um, eventually, the, um, the whole thing um, just kind of blew over and, you know, the children went to the segregated school after um, a little while. But that was enough for another incident in Kansas City the next year um, in 1925 um, Saturnino Alvarado was a father who had immigrated to Kansas City from Mexico, and he, along with two other families, kept their children out of school for an entire year rather than have them to attend a segregated school. And this is how that story goes. So these are four Mexican students who want to attend high school. Now, I told you there was a tripartite system, um, school system in Kansas City. That was just at the elementary school. So as students moved up in grades, fewer and fewer, in particular, Mexican and black families attended higher level schools because they were needed to work, you know, and that that income was needed, um, or just girl, girls weren't um, allowed to attend school that as they got older, um, that, um, that sort of thing. So these four students wanted to attend Argentine high school in 1925. And the school said, no, sorry, you can't. But the thing about this case is, um, you know how I mentioned that schools often use the, the students can't speak English, so we don't want them in our schools. Well, with these four high school students, they had already gone through elementary school in the United States, so they could speak perfect English. So that, um, that school, that argument um, could, could not um, be used. Anglo parents got whiff of this, you know, that these four students wanted to attend school. So they used that petition system again, saying we don't want these students in our school with our children. So what happened was the school board said, all right, here's what we're going to do for you. Your children can attend the school, but we're going to put them in a separate room for those four children for all of their learning. Right. And the parents said, 
Mexican parents refused that offer. They said, no, we want our children to attend school with the other children and it's get the same type of learning. The school board came back with a counter offer and said, hey, what if we pay for um, transportation and tuition to send your kids to school across state lines in Missouri so they can go to school over there? <laughs> the parents were like, no. We don't want our children sent across state lines into um, Missouri. So again, there was this threat of violence against the students um, and they lodged the complaint with the consul. And that this time the parents actually did keep their, the four students out of school for an entire year. They were that you know um, determined to have their kids to go to an integrated um, integrated school and you know the the city couldn't build this whole separate high school for just four four students right that doesn't that, that would not make monetary sense um so um so that's when the um so it's this back and forth again right between state and and federal government the state department etc cetera, etc cetera. and so finally you know, um, the the state attorney general is like, well, you know, I don't think that the school board can win this case because Mexicans are considered white under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, right? They went that far back. Um, and so eventually the next fall, all four of the students, well, three of the students, the fourth one um, who was, um, uh, a girl, Victorina Paris. She didn't. She didn't attend high school, but the other three did. The following fall, and one of the boys was even on the roster of the football team. So, um, and they all graduated. All three of those students graduated within four years. And actually, the student who was on the football team um, got a scholarship to Baker and played football, football there. And I heard a story that he helped Baker win. Um, win some football games because he taught the other players Spanish and they would like shout their plays in Spanish. I don't know if it's true, but that's the story I heard. Um, so the other way, and just real quickly, and I'm, I'm finished up so we have time for, for questions, was another form of resistance was the, the use of this cultural um, capital, right, as a form of pride. So this is a, a photo of a, a flyer for a, Mexican Independence Day celebration in Sept September uh, 1964. And you can't see it, but um, I put this flyer up here because um, as part of this celebration, much like they do with the, the Fiesta today, right? Queens were um, ran and uh, are, were nominated. And uh, on this flyer, it says that Her Majesty Virginia Gomez will be crowned um, queen. And this was um, at the Meadow Acres um, Ballroom, and for those of you who don't know, Virginia Gomez is now Virginia Mendoza, and is my mom. So I had to, I had to get a shout out up to that. <laughs> um, but other forms of uh, resistance um, took place at other at the high school level, right, by students. So this is a photo from a, a walkout led in in Kansas City, but there was also a walkout by Mexican students at Topeka High in um, the late 60s or early 70s. I think it was the early um, early 70s. And these students were influenced by school walkouts that were happening all over um, the country, demanding things like Mexican history be taught. Um, you know, um, so it was happening in, uh, in Kansas too. And perhaps as a, a result of these walkouts, um, other things that were happening was, for example, in Kansas City, the Atzlan Center opened, and this center catered to high school students with two main goals, quote, to teach Chicano young people the language, history, music, art, and literature of their Spanish and Native American culture, and to lead and encourage Chicano young people to find an active and productive role in their um, community. There were groups such as Lasso here at Washburn, Mecha at K-State, which did community work and particularly encouraged high school students to attend um, college as well as, you know, just to promote pride in, um, in culture. This happens all the way up into the 80s and 90s. This is the Azteca Club in, at Newton High School. It started out as a Spanish club, but it eventually evolved and is still in existence today. And one of the, the things that they do is it's a, it's a folklorical dance group 
the Mexican Folkloric or Dance Group. Um, it began with 15 to 20 students and has grown exponentially um, since then. You know, so I shall, um, I shall end there and take more questions. <laughs> Thank you.